All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming or tuning in remotely or watching this later, whichever you choose. Uh, we're going to have the pleasure of introducing the first of our speakers to the Grand Round series from Chief Residence. Today we have Carol Kunga speaking on healing the body, mind, and spirit. And then later we'll have Milhit Harsh talking about clinical reasoning and diagnosis. So first, let me introduce Carol Kunga. She did her undergraduate degree in combined pharmacy six-year program at the Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. She then went to medical school at Indiana University, and then she came here with us to do residency training. And Mohit Harsh grew, grew up in Hunting, West Virginia, came to undergrad at the Washington University in St. Louis, then went back to Hunting, West Virginia for medical school at Marshall University, and then came back here with us again for residency. And he will be speaking about getting the right diagnosis. So please join me in welcoming our speakers. Dr. Cash. Um, so today I'll be first thank everybody for being here and for joining in. Um, I'll be talking about the role of religion and spirituality when it comes to clinical practice and uh, physician wellness. Uh, Mohit and I do not have any disclosures today. And I wanted to dive a little bit into myself. Um, I was born in Cameroon, uh, which is Central Africa. I moved here after high school. Um, and my village is actually called Baham. It's a very diverse and, and uh, culturally uh, intense uh, place. Um, picture here is the king of the village, actually. Um, and after I moved, just like Dr. Cash mentioned, I, I went to MCPHS University for pharmacy degree. Um, I actually worked at CVS for a few years before going to Indiana for medical school. And I came here for residency, and I'll be uh, heading to Boston uh, for cardiology fellowship in a month. My time here has been uh, quite interesting and, and going through this journey, um, there have been some uh, time defining moments, but if I think of my residency, uh, 2020 was a very interesting year, um, notably because of COVID. Uh, for the first time, we had shut down for the entire city uh, that was uh, accompanied by no traveling. And uh, for a lot of us involved in healthcare, uh, if we were not home, we will come to the hospital and be faced by a scene that looks such as this. Um, and it was very challenging because, again, a lot of these patients were sick. They reminded me of myself, of my uncles and aunties and grandparents. And it did uh, leave a lot of us feeling exhausted emotionally and mentally. And um, if that was not enough, we also uh, had the killings of multiple unarmed black men uh, that year, which was again, very emotionally charging, um, hence the, the um, birth of the Black Lives Matter. And why am I bringing all of this is to say, I think for the first time, uh, my spiritual beliefs and, and uh, practices really helped me uh, keep my internal peace and deal with a lot of uncertainties and, and anxiety, uh, anger that was going on around that time. And the reason why I also want to bring this up is because actually within the African-American community, there is a very uh, unusual relationship between uh, religion and African-American community. And that all stems from um, our history. Um, a lot of the religious uh, organization and leaders were involved uh, in slavery and civil war movement, and they were also the ones supporting the community. So th those leaders are viewed um, and respected as leaders, uh, those um, clergy are viewed as leaders of the community itself, um, and they may influence the way individuals within the community uh, make decisions. Now, this is very true of the older generation, uh, 40 plus, but uh, in the era of social media, we have new influencers. So it's yet to know what the quote unquote black church uh, impact will have with the current youth uh, within America. So again, I hope uh, this small story really tells you why I decided to talk about uh, this topic today. And I hope by the end of my talk, uh, you'll be able to describe some perspective that both patients and providers have about the role of spirituality when it comes to clinical practice, 
Uh, hopefully we can identify some potential benefits uh, when it comes to clinical practice or wellness as well as harms. And how do we use this information to see if, if any, a religion could contribute uh, to our clinical practice in the future? So um, I want to preface this by saying a lot of the claims that will be made today uh, were based on some published data, uh, mostly psychosocial religious uh, information. And they were derived from interviews and surveys. Um, and so there could be some response bias. And a lot of sample size were small. And again, it's very hard to tell if the information that's being shared today can be extrapolated to the rest of the, the, the country or the rest of the community. So talking to patients, um, it seems like uh, some patients actually prefer to have the discussion of, of religion or spirituality left to them, their family, and their caregiver. Um, they do think, though, that uh, providers could discuss religion if it was initiated by the patient. However, talking to caregivers themselves, they actually thought maybe providers should engage into these conversations and also acknowledge and respect uh, uh, patients' beliefs. When it comes to um, religiosity and spirituality, um, there was actually a study done by Dr. Boucher uh, interviewing a few veterans. And what they found was um, veterans reported that providers should be able to accommodate some diverse spiritual beliefs. They should screen for spiritual needs and probably improve the visibility of such, such services uh, within the healthcare system. When it comes to providers, what do they think when you ask them about religion or spirituality? Um, it has been observed that physicians who reported being religious or spiritual uh, were more likely to connect uh, spirituality to patients' health. And they were also more, most often, uh, they included that into their interaction with patients. Um, they also acknowledge that um, Spirituality can be beneficial to the patient's mental health. And looking across the board, it seems like non-physician providers, most notably nurses, were more, most likely to believe that God could intervene into a patient's health. And nurses were also more frequently inquiring about spirituality and religion than any other provider. In addition, um, a survey that was done in my uh, ICU uh, physicians, uh, they did acknowledge that there is, a there is a responsibility for providers to address uh, these needs for patients. Um, and it had also been observed that physicians who were dealing with a lot of patients who were going through end of life um, were also much more comfortable with having these discussions. So we know this could be important, but unfortunately in real practice, um, this is not done often. And so there might be some limitations or barriers in approaching this subject and some published or proposed reasons why this is not happening. Uh, first is time. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to address the patient's concerns or medical problems. The other social determinant of health um, before talking about religion. And the second thing is, what's the evidence? How do we know this works for every single patient? What's the actual impact? Um, and so it's hard for us to really believe this is gonna be beneficial for every single patient. The second thing is, patient, uh, physicians are just uncomfortable. So it's the level of discomfort that prevents them from engaging um, in these discussions. And most importantly, maybe it's a lack of knowledge on how and when do we actually uh, obtain this type of information. Uh, a few surveys show that residents did report lacking the knowledge and skill in addressing religiosity or spirituality concerns of their patients. And uh, interviewing chaplains, they acknowledged that they did have good access to physicians, but somehow there was a perceived uh, structural barriers that prevented them from really being an integral part of the medical care. So what have been some benefits um, of religion when it comes to healthcare or, or patient's outcome? 
In general, it really allows you to have a better relationship with your patient. Approaching them as a whole individual, again, thinking of their body and the mind and the spirit health, um, just allows you to bond and, and build or foster a better relationship with them. Um, there have been some studies suggesting that uh, level of, re of religiosity could affect medication adherence. Uh, of note, uh, there was a, a study in Brazil looking at patients with heart failure uh, who were following up in clinic. And if they reported a higher level of religiosity, they tended to be more compliant with their medication. But another study uh, done in Louisiana, uh, now in the population, STI population, did show that you know, some practices could be um, could be positively associated or negatively associated with med uh, medication adherence. Again, there's not necessarily a great consistency in knowing if this is uh, sufficient or if this is real or pure chance, but there might be a correlation between uh, the practices that you do at home and the willingness to take medication every day. Uh, most importantly, it also seems that um, spirituality also help a lot of patients cope with their illness. Um, and could also improve the quality of life. Uh, there have been studies done in Malaysia in breast cancer of female uh, who were Muslim and the fact that they were religious did allow them to be much more hopeful and optimist about their care. Um, and in the HIV population, it has also been shown that a lot of these patients also tend to cope a little bit better and have a better quality of life. Now, um, what about physician wellness? There have been some studies specifically with EM physicians on um, potential dimension of religion or spirituality that could be beneficial uh, in burnout or if there could be other areas uh, that could be um, uh, looked at. And interestingly, there was no significant association between burnout and the level of, of spirituality or, or religiosity. However, I will point out that they did note that um, you were most, you were least likely to have a malpractice lawsuit if you uh, observe a day of rest um, from a religious standpoint, and uh, you were less likely to uh, have uh, maladaptive behaviors if you were engaged in organized religious activities. Some additional wellness studies that have been done on this topic um, have noted that, again, in EM physicians, uh, one of the releasing factor uh, could actually be personal spirituality. Um, a lot of residents actually um, with spiritual well-being uh, seem to have a greater sense of work accomplishment, self-rated uh, self health, and reduced burnout. And uh, looking at COVID specifically, uh, some providers did have a higher level of hope or optimism, um, which correlated with a less amount of COVID-related anxiety if uh, they did practice uh, regularly. Now, this doesn't mean that uh, there are no harm or risk associated with uh, religious beliefs. Uh, one of such uh, beliefs or delays in care, uh, unfortunately, some patients uh, may uh, rely on spiritual healing and may not necessarily seek care uh, on a timely manner. And uh, a few times also they may refuse uh, suggested treatment if um, for you know, some of the listed uh, reasons that are there, some patients may prefer a particular gender. Um, it's well known that Jeho Jehovah Witnesses do not want to have uh, blood products and uh, cancer and STI screening can be uh, viewed negatively uh, in certain uh, religious beliefs. So again, a lot of these um, uh, cases or examples are reasons why patients may not seek help just based on their spiritual beliefs. Um, of note, there was a group in uh, Boston University that uh, interviewed 249 US adults and noted that there was uh, a predictable acceptance of COVID vaccination in those who had decreased level of re uh, religiosity. So um, again, that could be a potential harm um, of, of the, such practices. Based on a lot of the information that I presented, um, I'm hopeful that maybe in the future we could maybe redefine 
or address some of the, the resources that I may be underused at the moment uh, when it comes to religion and spirituality. Of note, I think uh, healthcare workers or organizations could probably partner up with religious organizations when it comes to public health endeavors. Uh, they have multiple uh, examples listed here. Uh, one of such, um, I trained church health educators who can then go back to their uh, churches and recruit and, um, and conduct some programs. Um, the second thing is, you know, we always talk about disparities when it comes to uh, a healthcare delivery. Maybe Black churches could also be involved in, in fighting against disparity or addressing some of those issues. And when it comes to advanced uh, care planning, maybe approaching it or adjusting the education uh, material from a faith-based uh, approach could probably improve um, the implementation and success of advanced care planning among African Americans. When it comes to wellness, um, I'm sorry, before we go to wellness, the other thing is, again, chaplains, how often do we engage chaplains? How often do we uh, engage uh, spiritual leaders? Maybe we need to think about better approach or ways to integrate them into our care. Um, and maybe we need to optimize the way we train our providers uh, so that they want them aware or on how and when to approach these such subjects and who to reach out to if, if needed. Um, and finally, it's important to consider religion and spirituality when it comes to wellness, uh, because again, a lot of providers are coming from those communities and they still see religion and spirituality as a tool to deal with burnout. And so maybe future strategies in addressing well, uh, wellness or burnout uh, may involve also addressing spirituality and religion. And so um, I first would love to thank Dr. Frazier and Dr. Costco for such an opportunity and all of the APDs, my mentors, my squad, <laughs> who um, has been instrumental in having a great time here at, at WashU, the amazing uh, house staff faculty online and uh, the rest of my village, mostly uh, picture here. Thank you. All right, and as I mentioned in the chat, we're gonna hold questions for both speakers till the end, uh, just for the sake of time. Well, Carol, I feel like I'm always following in your footsteps, whether that's going to the VA <clears throat> or following up after grand rounds. That was a fantastic talk. Thank you for all the house staff that are here today, all the faculty that are here today and attending virtually. And thank you, Devin, for your kind introductions. Um, I think I speak on behalf of all the co-chiefs that I have when I say it's been an absolute honor and privilege to serve the Department of Medicine and the residency program in this role for the past year. Um, and we are again honored to provide departing grand rounds over the next several weeks. My talk today is on the pursuit of clinical excellence. And I purposefully use the word pursuit because this is a lifelong journey. I obviously have not found the secret sauce to this recipe, but I hope by the end of this talk, you can come away with at least one approach to improve your own clinical skills. There are many ways that someone can become clinically excellent. I think we all know of these role models who are able to uplift our learners and be able to create an engaging environment in even the most mundane encounters. Or the physicians who have devoted their careers to uplifting our patients and raising awareness about how our systems fail even the most vulnerable. We've all interacted with those attendings who go above and beyond for their patients, be it in the clinic or on the wards. They somehow seem to know every single guideline and every local resource like it's the back of their hand. There are some clinicians who excel at bringing us together, guiding us through years of a global pandemic while still trying to create bridges to create the best learning environment possible. We know of clinicians who have an incessant drive 
to tackle some of the hardest research and clinical questions out there, focusing their life's work on improving the care of patients with deadly diseases. Now, observing clinical excellence in motion is actually what motivated me to come to WashU in the first place. I was sitting in Clopton Auditorium listening to CPC during my recruitment day. There was a case of a young woman presenting with dyspnea and hypoxemia. The attending, Dr. Warren Isakoff, after hearing just the story and looking at what seemed to be a pretty normal chest x-ray, was able to correctly diagnose the patient with pulmonary venoocclusive disease. Now, I was astonished. This may be a picture of me during match day, <laughs> but I can assure you my face looked exactly like this, although I may have lost a lot of hair along the way. <laughs> For one, what the heck was that diagnosis? I'd never heard of pulmonary venoocclusive disease. And two, how the heck did he even come up with that diagnosis just from the story and looking at a chest x-ray? This was my first true exposure to clinical reasoning and motion being described aloud. I knew I had to come train at a place that had these brilliant attendings that were able to describe their mechanics of reasoning. But you know, I thought to myself, perhaps this is a one-off scenario. They just hired this really brilliant clinician for the purpose of recruitment. It can't be that all these attendings are able to do this by looking at a chest x-ray. Well, as I started intern year and I rotated in the MICU, I was surely wrong. I came across someone else who does just that. And I think all the house staff in the room know exactly who I'm talking about. Enter Dr. Marin Colliff. <laughs> The house staff definitely know what I'm saying, but for those of you who have yet to work with him in the medical ICU or watch him dissect a case during CPC, he has a pretty famous interest in chest x-rays. He can, just like Dr. Isakoff did, listen to the one-liner about a patient, look at their chest x-ray, and be able to fill in all the other details before you say another word. In fact, he did this with me as an intern on a 28-hour call. We had an older gentleman who had chronic respiratory failure from post-polio syndrome. He was coming in with subacute worsening of his respiratory symptoms and hypoxemia. He listened to my story, heard the one-liner, looked at a chest x-ray, and very astutely said, so this is just the post-polio syndrome progressing, isn't it? And went on to talk to the patient. Now to my significantly tired eyes at hour 24 of this call, I couldn't believe it. He hadn't heard about my extensive workup that I planned to do. He hadn't heard about my plans to start empiric antibiotics, especially his favorite, ceftaroline, and my scratch pad notes on the vent settings that we were going to start for this patient. How on earth could he have been so confident in this diagnosis? I knew he had been around quite a while, and we had talked after the, uh, taking care of the patient about the numerous patients with post-polio syndrome he treated in Colorado. So I think that was it, right? He's just seen this before just like he's seen every other diagnosis that comes through the ICU. Now to put icing on the cake, later on during residency, he would be a discussant at CPC. And after hearing the story and looking at a chest X-ray, he would be able to diagnose pulmonary venoocclusive disease, just like I saw years before. At that point, I knew there had to be something about becoming an expert diagnostician. So how is it that two, albeit seasoned critical care attendings, we're able to get to the same diagnosis with the same amount of info. And how is it that they can utilize one piece of information, a chest x-ray, to somehow connect several hundred dots of information about a patient's clinical status into one unifying diagnosis? These early experiences got me intrigued in answering one simple question. How do doctors make diagnoses and how can we do it well? For the sake of the talk, I'll be focusing on how we improve our clinical reasoning. I selfishly became even more interested in this topic during chief year when my clinical exposure dramatically dropped. My patients were now replaced with lengthy email chains and constant emails from the house staff about what Racanales is bringing for lunch. <laughs> if you leave this talk with one image and one idea, it should be this one. This is a performance graph that can be applied to any learnable skill that we develop in our lives be it riding a bike, making scrambled eggs, interpreting an ABG, or presenting a complex patient. Any skill set or any performance within a profession follows this curve. On the x-axis, you have time, and on the y-axis, you have performance. At the very beginning of the curve, at some point, you have a very slow progress despite working extremely hard. 
This may be the early years of medical school or just at the beginning of internship. Then you reach this steep part of the curve where you get an enormous amount of growth over a very short period of time because of a very dense learning uh, experience. That could be residency or fellowship. Near the end of your training, you start to plateau on this graph. And by about five years after your terminal training, you reach a point where you become quite comfortable with diagnosing and managing pretty much everything that walks through the door. You become what is called an experienced clinician. Now, I'm looking in the audience and I see a lot of house staff. And I wanna ask you all, raise your hands if you've gotten this advice before. You just need to read more. You just need to see more patients. See a lot of head nods. Even Dr. Frazier is raising her hand. But I think we all inherently know that you do not become Kobe, Jordan, or LeBron just from experience alone. Yet we prescribe experiential growth to our learners by saying read more and you just need to see more patients. And this advice, and this advice comes from a good place. Sorry. This advice comes from a good place. It is true that reading more will improve our clinical reason. And it is true that seeing more patients will make our reasoning sounder. But what we are describing in this path is becoming an experienced clinician. And I'll be clear, becoming an experienced clinician is no easy task, and it is a very noble pursuit that we should all strive to achieve. But over time, we reach a point of diminishing returns. We no longer gain much incremental growth with each diabetic foot infection that we treat or every chest pain that we rule out in the emergency room. We become good at our job and we become quite confident in our approaches, but we taper off. In other words, we don't get as much out of every rep. This is where the distinction occurs between being an experienced clinician and becoming an expert clinician. Those who pursue clinical excellence find a way to get every last drop of juice from their clinical reps and continue to climb in performance through the longevity of their careers. They follow the motto, the version of myself tomorrow is better than the version of myself today. So how do they do it? The remaining portion of my talk is going to focus on some evidence-based strategies to improve clinical reasoning and, for that matter, any clinical skill. I'll reiterate, I definitely have not found the secret sauce to the recipe, and I'm very much on the steep learning curve portion of this graph, but I hope to share some practices that I have found helpful along the way. If there is one person who has thought about this topic the most, it is Dr. Gupreet Daliwal. He is a professor of medicine at UCSF and a practicing internist. He is known as a master diagnostician and has studied how doctors make diagnoses and how we excel in our practices. He and his colleagues published a study in the Journal of GIM, looking at the early career habits and experiences of peer-selected master clinicians at UCSF they found four key themes that emerged in their analysis. For one, consistent learning efforts. Physicians interviewed all had early career focuses on reading consistently nearly every day, finding opportunities to teach as much as they could and tracking patient outcomes. I'll touch a little bit more on, on uh, following patients later on. Number two, rigorous skill development. They took additional efforts in improving their communication skills and physical exam skills by seeking feedback from peers and mentors. They even went above and beyond and took additional courses in communications. Number three, cultivating habits of mind. They kept certain mindsets at the core of what they did, whether that was humanism and medicine, finding their joy in medicine, being humble about their abilities and evoking curiosity by always asking why. And finally, number four, a clinically rich environment. The participants also practiced in high volume settings where they saw an enormous amount of patients and were pushed out of their comfort zone. They also took every opportunity to discuss cases with their peers. Many moonlighted in community hospitals or picked up night shifts where they were the only physician in house. Now there's a lot to dissect with each of these areas. So I really encourage you to read this article, but I want to highlight three approaches that will allow you to hone your craft. We see a lot of patients in training, like a lot. But how many of them are you able to follow and track how they did after you leave a rotation? Maybe it's your last stretch of nights, 
or you just came off a busy consult service. How many of those patients do we get structured feedback on that our diagnoses were correct and that our care plans actually did some benefit for the patient? For me, and I'm sure for many of you listening in, it's not many. When we don't get feedback on our patients consistently, our brain assumes that we've made the right judgment call. Let's say you're working in the emergency room and you evaluate a patient for chest pain. After a careful history and working up the patient, you counsel them that they are not having a heart attack, but instead they're having heartburn. How do you know that you made the right diagnosis? Unless we track that patient's chart, call the patient, talk to their primary care provider, you won't know how they did or if you made the right management plan. Unless we track that patient's chart and find out that they're back in the emergency room for chest pain and then they went for a heart cath, we have this assumption that our decisions were correct and we approach the next patient in the exact same way without improving for the next one. This is why following up on patients is one of the greatest tools that we have for self-improvement. Tracking outcomes of our decisions allows us to calibrate our diagnostic skills. We can't do this with every patient. I for sure have tried, it is a near impossible task, but doing this on select patients where you are unsure about the diagnosis or you're just curious about the outcome allows you to find closure. It allows you to find your mistakes or misdiagnoses and ultimately will teach you about the natural history of disease. There are a few ways that you can operationalize this into your daily workflow. You can utilize the power of Epic to build a patients to follow up on list or an interesting patients list so that you can learn about a disease and if the management strategies that you implemented really were effective. You can set reminders in the patient charts to follow up on those labs or check in on their symptoms. And many of us do this for other reasons, be it a quality metric like checking that Q6 month A1C on our diabetic patients, or maybe it's following up on that CT scan that radiology recommended three months ago. But if we utilize these reminders for a different reason, to sharpen our clinical reasoning skills, the learning can be streamlined into our current workflow. It probably comes as no surprise to many of you, especially the house staff, that I enjoy talking about cases. If you've ever watched me moderate report, I really do. I enjoy hearing how other people think and reason, what challenges came up to get to the final diagnosis, and how much team effort was needed to come up with the patient's treatment options. In some ways, I do this out of a selfish desire to improve. This allows me to be a curious fly on the wall and absorb all the information about a real life case without having to do all the legwork. Beyond passively hearing about other teams' cases, I try my best to consistently reflect on cases with peers. One great way of doing this is finding an academic partner. An academic partner is someone that you were able to share not only your success stories, but more importantly, those cases that you struggled with. The case where you thought that that headache with blurry vision was just a tough migraine that the patient was dealing with. But you look in their chart and two days later, they show up in the emergency room and they ultimately are diagnosed with giant cell arteritis. Or that case where you saw those liver chemistry elevations and you chalked it up to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But later on, a few months later, you check in the chart and you find out that that was their index presentation of metastatic disease. Your academic partner should be able to question your reasoning and point out your potential cognitive biases. This person doesn't have to be a co-resident. It doesn't even have to be a colleague in your own specialty. In some ways you want someone who is out of your field and out of your institution to give you a broader perspective. I have thankfully found that person and I have learned a great deal from them. We went to medical school together and his ability to think about patterns related back to pathophysiology and his incessant curiosity keeps me on my toes whenever we talk about cases, which is nearly every week. He may not have been trained in internal medicine, but he is one of the best internists that I know. My friend, Eamon Marr is actually a dermatologist by training, yet we discuss all sorts of internal medicine cases. And this goes both ways. He also tests my own knowledge about dermatology by sending me interesting cases. And he really pushes my vocabulary by making me describe lesions beyond maculopapular. In sports, 90% of the job is practice. They run drills, shoot threes, come up with plays and scrimmage, all for the other 10% of the time that they're actually on game day. 
In medicine, we work in the exact opposite way. 90% of what we do is with real life patients and we may get 10% to practice. Maybe this is why they call what we do the practice of medicine, just for the irony. It is already a formidable task to get through our clinical work through the day. And if we do this alone, we can become experienced clinicians. But those that go on to become expert clinicians are very intentional about what they do day to day. They take their encounters just a couple steps forward. Master clinicians consistently do something called deliberate practice. And there are three forms of practice, naive, purposeful, and deliberate practice. Naive practice is what we all do. We see patients, we care for them, and we passively learn from the function of doing, the see one, do one, teach one model. Purposeful practice, as the name suggests, is practice with a purpose. You're about to enter your cardiology rotation and you really want to hone in on those car uh, cardiac auscultation skills. So you work and seek out to find those murmurs. Or you know for yourself that you're uncomfortable with central lines. And so you seek out more procedures to improve your technical skills. This requires specific goals in mind and getting out of your comfort zone. Deliberate practice is what I just described, but with structured feedback. It is not enough to just place more central lines if you're uncomfortable with them. You have to seek out the feedback from a skilled proceduralist who can guide you on the proper technique and provide you stepwise feedback and increase the nuance that is taught. If you've ever wished, you know, I come out of my CCU rotation feeling really comfortable with EKGs and a month later I forget them all over again. Or man, I just finished ID and I really feel comfortable with my antibiotic coverage but I know in three months from now, I'm not gonna remember a thing. This is the approach that you should take. Develop a consistent schedule of spaced learning and feedback and find someone to pro provide you that feedback. Be intentional about what skills you want to develop. And this will allow you to achieve, achieve tangible growth in any clinical skill, rather than hoping random experiences will carve out that ability for you. Case conferences is another fantastic way to improve our clinical reasoning skills. Instead of passively listening, even the simple act of engaging and asking questions or racking your brain to come up with differential diagnoses can go a long way. Doing the mental gymnastics of trying to solve the case with each aliquot of information is just another way to prime your mind when you encounter that scenario in real life. There is a reason that pilots run simulations nonstop or that athletes run drills. Approaching morning reports with deliberate practice in mind, if you just spend 10 to 15 minutes that day looking up that final diagnosis, it will cement your knowledge even further. The pursuit of clinical excellence is a lifelong journey. And I've shared just a handful of approaches and focused on how we improve our clinical and diagnostic reasoning. There are so many other areas that we need to strive for excellence in that I didn't cover be it our emotional quotients, our ability to have good bedside manner, our ability to appraise clinical evidence, just to name a few. The approaches I described, following up on patients, talking with our colleagues, and deliberate practice can be used to improve any clinical domain that you have your mind set on. Used consistently and systematically, forming these habits will help you bridge the gap between being an experienced clinician and pursuing clinical excellence. I want to leave you all with just a few resources that I have found incredibly helpful in my own pursuits. Obviously, like I've been saying, our patients and our colleagues teach us the most, so I encourage you to learn as much as you can from them. The Clinical Problem Solvers is an online platform that aims to, focus, aims to improve our diagnostic reasoning through report-style discussions. I encourage you to listen to their podcasts and check out their website. I've learned a bunch just from listening to them going back and forth from work. There are multiple journals that have clinical conundrums where authors dissect cases and provide teaching points along the way. I challenge you to read those cases and blind yourself to the final diagnosis, putting yourself in the clinician's shoes to solve that case. And if you're getting bored with Wordle at this point, check out the Human Diagnosis Project. It's a free app with user submitted cases that you can solve in less than five minutes. And it provides you immediate feedback on your diagnosis and some teaching points along the way. My own journey in this talk could not be possible without a few individuals that I would really like to name. 
Gupreet Dhaliwal for being a role model to many, including myself, and for his own efforts in studying how doctors think and for his generous support of this talk. Reza Manesh for guiding me in improving my diagnostic skills and being a constant sounding board. Jerome Escoda for investing in me, in me and providing me opportunities to be an educator. And Bob Centaur for embodying what it means to be a lifelong learner in the pursuit of clinical excellence. There's your CME. I hope you all have a wonderful morning. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you for those excellent talks. We have a few questions in the chat. First, I'll look around the room and see if there are any questions in person. Dr. Frazier. Thank you both for those terrific talks. Uh, Carol, I'll start with you. you know, religions and spirituality obviously are incredibly important, but also incredibly diverse. Do you have any comments about the roles of specific religions or the differences in, in religions or spirituality that we should? try to understand more about to better care for our patients? Uh, thank you, Dr. Frazier. Um, oh. Briefly, uh, the question was, do I have more insight on the different uh, religions or practices uh, that could impact the way we practice or, or care for patients? And I wish I could tell you, I'm, I'm an expert in this, but I'm not. Um, when I was preparing for this talk, I, I do focus a little bit more on uh, one, the black community and two specific religions, but uh, there are way many more uh, that are available. I know that there have been some work uh, with uh, Buddhism, um, specifically when it comes to meditation and wellness and mental health, but I myself uh, don't know much about it for me to be able to provide some advice on how to approach those. So my question or my advice to all of you will be to be curious, um, so first is asking your patients if they have particular practices and learning about it. You could learn from them or you could actually do your individual uh, learning and, and get partnering up with uh, one of the, the chaplain or clergies because we may not have the skills or the knowledge, but using those resources might be actually better to care for those patients. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so I guess for uh, going off of that kind of question, what ways are like, in what, how should we ask these questions to our patients? Um, you know, I think sometimes it's like, well, this patient's being admitted at the hospital for a diabetic foot infection, like Mo had mentioned, like where is the best way or how is the best way to ask those questions about the patient's religion and spirituality? Um, one is asking them how they are receiving the diagnosis, how are they feeling, and where do they go to, one, find a purpose, and what resources, or how do, you, how do they actually assimilate the information that you're giving them? They might be willing to disclose, again, based on some of the surveys that were done, a lot of patients felt like they would prefer initiating the conversation, and so once you um, ask them about you know, how do they receive the diagnosis, how do they deal with uh, failure or conflicts or you know, new diagnosis of, of critical illness or end of life uh, diagnosis, like how do they assimilate or deal with that particular diagnosis, they may then be willing to disclose, okay, I'm using the spiritual practices to deal with this, or how are you coping with this you know, diagnosis, that's when they could possibly disclose this information, but they may choose not to. The questions. Good chat and there are a few. But JP asks, are there any studies looking at the intersection of religious religion, spirituality, health, and the LGBT populations? There were a few that I you know just skimmed through. Um, it depends on the society or where those LGBT Q1 uh, A are, but in general, unfortunately, because of a lot of the stigma 
uh, associated uh, with that subgroup. Um, there have been some negative association with religious um, beliefs or practices, uh, if they were openly willing to uh, declare that they were part of that group. And all of it really stemmed for, from isolation. So a lot of the protective effect of religious practices practices uh, was really felt when people did join those organizations and were frequent uh, um, uh, visitors of such organizations. But um, unfortunately, in the spiritual um, uh, world, and a lot of the reports that I saw, a lot of that subgroup has been marginalized. And I think they we need to do, again, it's hard for me to tell the, the religious organization how to deal with this, but really being able to open the conversation and expand, uh, again, partnership with those organizations uh, is the first step to take. But there has been some negative uh, outcome based on the subgroup. Okay. Another question, do the benefits of religion and spirituality seem to be consistent across religions and levels of religiosity and spirituality? Not, no. <laughs> Um, uh, and like I said at the beginning, a lot of these uh, reported benefits or associations have been, they're mostly observations and um, it's hard to tell if any of this will be applicable to the general population. And, and again, like I mentioned earlier, I did focus a lot on, on Christianity and Islam, specifically, specifically within the African-American community because of the history that they have with religion, but no, the results are not consistent, unfortunately. All right, we have a two for from Kevin. The first is for Carol. What advice do you have for providers who do not practice organized religion or frankly uncomfortable uh, with it in supporting their patients who have strong spirituality that's based in organized religion? The advice is, again, be curious. Um, <clears throat> And I, I don't want to say educate yourself, but be curious. Uh, you don't have to necessarily agree with their practices, but the, the, the knowledge that you have about what they may or may not be doing could also help you guide uh, the way, or at least help you explain certain reaction or, or decisions that your patients take. Um, I'll take an example, fasting, for example. You may adjust the way you, you um, treat the patient or you may delay adjusting some of the medications if you're aware of particular periods when they're fasting. Uh, other things, there are some rituals uh, that people may have to do right before they have surgery or right after, right before they bury a, a corpse. And so allowing them to, allowing them that time and respecting that particular practice is just, again, trying to foster the the relationship that you have with those patients. You may not understand it, but just my advice would be be curious. If a patient shares with you that they have a particular practice and you and you have the time, ask them if there's a resource or a way for you to learn more about it. Yeah. All right, the next one's from Mohit. We'll be careful break. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think the role of academic research is, if any, in the pursuit of clinical excellence? I think that's a great question. Um, for myself personally, I don't find much benefit in it. I don't like research, but um, I think there is a huge role in it because it influences a, a habit of mind that a lot of master clinicians have, which is evoking curiosity. So especially if you're doing clinically focused research, be it outcomes research, be it um, uh, trials, you name it, um, you are discussing and trying to figure out how are our systems or how are our practices improving or negatively impacting our patients. And I think that in and of itself creates this curiosity for those that do research that then make us question the things that we do. We do a lot of things in medicine that we perhaps do for no reason. So I think this is another area that I didn't get a chance to um, evoke, but the um, critical appraisal of evidence, if you are actively engaged in contributing to that literature, I think you inherently become a lot more astute in your ability to then critically appraise the other literature that you read. The PhD in me would be remiss if I did mention that <laughs> clinical advances are based on the somewhat fruitless initial research efforts, like the development of antiretrovirals for uh, 
COVID. So correct. You can't, uh, <laughs> you you can't really you become more expert until the basic research is done. And uh, Dr. Frazier is giving me the only applause. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really mean that. <laughs> He meant personally, he's yes. more yeah. interested in clinical care than research, but research is very important. Yes. Oh, it is. Absolutely. Yes. I myself just don't like, I like to read it. I don't like to do it. <laughs> All right. Any final questions from the room or from the chat uh, before we close out today? All right. Well, thank you to both our coaches, my coaches, for being here and giving these excellent talks. Uh, I look forward to next week where myself and <laughs> John and John will be speaking on uh, the benefits of geolocalized patient care and theater in medicine. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody.